amount of people here. It's 10.32. So, let's see here. Should probably remind everybody since we we haven't been meeting on Zoom regularly, just about the Zoom etiquette of making sure that you mute yourself. And, uh, you know, when it's your turn to speak, uh, that's when you can unmute yourself. I thought it might be fun throughout the service this morning if you wanted to uh, chat with people and kind of stay, stay active and be able to fellowship a little bit. Uh, I mean, that's always encouraged, but maybe a, a way I could even focus you a little bit is you could just write things in the chat uh, that you think are benefits of meeting on Zoom. Things that are good, like the fact that I can wear shorts on a Zoom call. I couldn't do that if we were meeting at Broadway Hall. And I just, I would love to do that to, to frame this in a positive light rather than in a negative light. And so if you can think of just funny things like that to type in the chat with each other, you know, even if 30 minutes from now one occurs to you, just could be fun. You know, one benefit of being on Zoom is blank. Um, okay, so we're going to get started here, rocking and rolling. And uh, one benefit is we've got Ron here with us. And uh, Ron is going to say a prayer to open our service. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to the North Sound Church of Christ. It's good to meet. Um, I know that some people probably have COVID fatigue and probably Zoom fatigue because they do this for work now. But for us older folk, um, it's kind of a blessing. Um, we get to see you and we're not spreading germs with each other. So um, we had a, um, uh, yesterday, we had a little meeting down in our common area. You know, we did a Thanksgiving dinner. We were socially distanced and all that kind of stuff. And we had about maybe 10 or 12 people in the room spread out. And um, afterwards, we thought about what are we grateful for? What are we giving thanks for? And so um, I want to read a, um, just Psalm, Psalm 95, 1 through 3. And it says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For our Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. Um, so we, we kind of shared a little bit, but later on I was giving that some thought. And just before I went to sleep, I was praying and, and I thought, what am I really grateful for? And all I could think about was the person who reached out to me and helped me to make Jesus Lord of my life and all the people that spent so much time, so much of their time helping me to be the person that I am today. And um, so if, if you want to thank anybody, think about the person that spent all that time on you. Um, I'm sure they could have been doing other things, making money or or doing all the things that the world tells us they want us to do, studying, being better, getting degrees, whatever it is, but they spent that time making sure that we got salvation. And so that's what I'm really grateful for today. So let's go to God in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this day, for the fellowship that you've given us, and for the people that you've changed. You've changed their hearts from stone to that of a beating, loving, caring, giving society that only looks out for each other. Help the rest of the world, Lord, come to an understanding of what it is that you expect from us, that you want from us, that you desire from us. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And we pray to you through your glorious son's name. Amen. Amen. All right. We've got our sisters who are going to bless us with song and uh, I'm going to pull up some uh, lyrics here for us all in uno momento.
cool. Good morning. <laughs> We're going to be starting with Soon and Very Soon. So if you have a songbook in front of you or the lyrics already here. So I, my brain just didn't work. So let's get started. One, two, three, four. Soon and very soon. Let's restart. We're starting. There it is. There we go. <laughs> run. Run. One, two, ready, go. I'll play it through and then yeah. I can start. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. And with the ukulele, it feels almost uh, tropical, like we're not in the, the winter and the gloom. Uh, but really, that was beautiful. That was uh, wonderful, girls. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. Um, okay. You know, it, it's funny. One of the reasons why we're doing Zoom and we're not meeting in person is exactly for the praise and worship. Uh, we could technically be meeting in the Broadway Hall, but that would mean that we can't sing together as a church. And so much of what we do is giving praise to God, not just passively listening. So that, that's why we decided to be better for us to just meet on Zoom. Plus, it's also a lot safer. So what we're going to do, uh, because this is Zoom, uh, I'm going to try and keep my lesson to really just 20 minutes instead of 30 uh, that could be something that you want to put in the chat as a benefit of meeting on Zoom, something you're grateful for. I don't know, uh, but I am going to try and keep it brief. So I'm just going to jump right into the Bible verse. Here it is, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called children of God. Remember last week we did blessed are the pure in heart uh, for they will see god's face and this week peacemakers will be called children of god there's kind of a pairing i think between the two of getting close to god being intimate with him relationally uh, let me ask you this at the outset has there ever been a time more ripe for the peacemakers of God. I mean, has there ever been a time more necessary in your lifetime for peacemakers? About five years ago, a social psychologist named Jonathan Haidt talked about his greatest fear that at some point, the uh, centrifugal force in our country that, that pushes people out away from each other would get so great uh, that we wouldn't be able to hold together. 
Uh, do you remember these when you were a kid? They don't have these on playgrounds anymore, uh, as you can see, because they're just tetanus factories. Uh, but if you were blessed to grow up with one of these, you remember the goal was to get it going around and around as fast as you could so that hopefully somebody would get thrown off. And, and, and then you could gauge like how much distance can you get them to launch. And the farther the distance, the better it is. Uh, this is an example of centrifugal force. And Jonathan Haidt said about five years ago that the centrifugal force in our country wasn't that great. Uh, even though it was pretty polarized, uh, it, you know, there wasn't a great crisis in our country. He's, he said, actually, in the 1960s, during the civil rights movement, there was much more centrifugal force. You remember during that time, there were riots. There was police brutality. Uh, it, it was a, a, a very scary time for the country. But what happened was there was actually more centripetal force at the same time, meaning there, there were forces that pulled us in together. So things like the, the Christian faith, you know, much of the country identified as Christian in the 1960s. Uh, also, uh, a sense of patriotism. Uh, there, there was still a sense that, you know, we're all Americans in this together. There were also strong cultural norms and expectations for people. Uh, the, the concern that Jonathan Haidt had was, what if the centrifugal force in our country gets stronger and there's no centripetal force to pull us and keep us together? And that's exactly where we're at right now. You know, with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, there is a, a massive centrifugal force pushing people, uh, you know, away from each other. And we don't have the same centripetal force bringing us together. I, I can tell you personally, there's never been a time in my life where I felt that the country needs peacemakers more. Uh, I, I just see the strife, the division, the anger. Uh, there's no trust in our authorities. There's no trust in what it means there's no agreement in what it means to be an American. Uh, and certainly uh, faithfulness to God is at an all-time low. Uh, people are, are leaving the church. They're, they're not even wanting to uh, believe in God. And so this is, this is a time like none other in my lifetime where I believe the world needs peacemakers. It needs us to act like children of God and go out into the world making peace. So are you with me on that? I'm starting heavy. This, this picture of a merry-go-round is just to hopefully lighten the reality of what I'm actually saying. This is heavy stuff, right? What I want to do is I want to define peacemaker with you briefly so that we're all on the same page there. So a peacemaker, uh, as I'm trying to define it, as I believe the Bible defines it, is one who promotes harmony and resolution between opposing parties, right? Promotes harmony and resolution. It, it tries to resolve conflict between two parties that have friction and are at odds. You think of a diplomat. Uh, a diplomat is a peacemaker who knows that two countries have different priorities uh, for what they believe is going to benefit their people, their nation, and a diplomat tries to bring those two parties together in harmony and resolution. A marriage counselor is a type of peacemaker. When two married uh, people, uh, spouses, are not getting along, that marriage counselor tries to promote harmony and resolution between them. Any parent of siblings has to be a peacemaker. There are times where you, your children are going to be at each other's throats, and you've got to promote harmony and resolution. And lastly, you know, disciples. Disciples are peacemakers. We go out into a world that is divided between man and man, between man and woman, between woman and woman, uh, between humans and God. And our job is to go and promote harmony and resolution. Now, I think the world's idea of peacemaking is very different than this. Uh, the world's idea of peacemaking often involves harming one of the opposing parties, pressuring them or, or even using a physical force to come in line with the dominant party's will. Uh, this can involve bombing, weapons, uh, but you know, if we want to promote our interests, then the way to make peace 
is to make the opposing party conform to our interests. Uh, you, you might have read George Orwell's 1984. In George Orwell's 1984, he famously satirizes government and says that the War Department was renamed the Peace Department. That's how the world likes to promote peace, through war. But saying that it's for our own best interests, our public interest. Uh, in, in America, uh, something like this happened, uh, you know, in the 1800s, the, the Colt 45 became the pistol of choice for the American military. It, it was a much more reliable handgun uh, than the single shot, you know, gunpowder, you know, style uh, pistols. Uh, there were other revolvers on the market at the time also, but the Colt 45 was very reliable in the field. Uh, so it got nicknamed the, the gun that tamed the West. And there was one enterprising gun dealer who named it the Peacemaker. Have you ever heard of that? The, the pistol called the Peacemaker? This became ubiquitous in Western films. So John Wayne famously had uh, a Peacemaker on his side. Uh, now, Jesus said, blessed are the Peacemakers. They will be called children of God. But I don't think this is the kind of peacemaking that Jesus had in mind. That peacemaker in John Wayne's hand is not a child of God, right? But that's kind of the way that we think about peacemaking, that might makes right. Uh, a bullet can produce peace. And, and this is the way that the world thinks, isn't it? it it's not what Jesus was teaching. You know, I, I think... For many people, if they were tasked with making peace, let's say in a violent community, let's say a city that is having unrest and riots and police brutality and both sides are opposed and you are tasked with going in there to bring peace. And if you are given the choice between a gun or a Bible, how many do you think would choose the Bible? I would think very, very few would choose the Bible. I think most people would want to choose the gun, even if their task was to make peace. And I think the reason for that is because you want to have more control. You want to have more, more power, more autonomy. A Bible, <laughs> well, you have to rely on God for that. You have to trust in God to make peace. If you have a gun, you can rely on yourself. Uh, but, you know, even a Colt 45, as reliable as it is, uh, and any gun you might have that's even more reliable now with modern uh, technology, it's not ever going to be as reliable as God is. Take a look at Psalm 33 here. It says, no king is saved by the sides of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it can't save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. Uh, the scripture is saying that it's not a bullet that brings peace. It's God. Don't doubt for a minute that there's more power in a single prayer than in a full clip in a, in a sidearm. Don't doubt for a minute that there's more power in prayer than there is in guns and bombs. Don't doubt it for a minute. This is what scripture teaches us. It's God who brings peace. I'm not saying that God doesn't use nations. In Acts 17, we read about how he raises nations up and he tears nations down. And obviously he does that with weapons. He does that sometimes through famine. Uh, through pestilence and things like that. Without a doubt, God uses material things to uh, accomplish his spiritual purposes. But make no mistake, it's God who does it. It's not us. And so making peace means bringing harmony uh, and bringing resolution between two opposing parties, not through our own power, but through God's. There is no peace to be made unless we first go to God. A peacemaker, I think, knows this. They, they go to God. They go to God first, 
before they try anything else. They go to God in prayer. They go to God in Bible study to know what his will is. And then after they've attempted whatever means they have available to them, they go back to God and they keep praying and they keep reading his word and they keep trying to understand what would God have me do in this circumstance. A peacemaker goes to God first. Now, Jesus says, if you'll be a peacemaker, you'll be a child of God. And what a great promise is that? Like, the world may say, if you try to make peace spiritually, or you try to make peace by being a, a, a humble and meek uh, person, that makes you look weak. The, the world might want to say that you're, you're a better peacemaker with, with a weapon in your hand. Uh, but Jesus says, actually, if you're a peacemaker and you trust in God, that makes you a child of God. And is there really anything more powerful, more strong than a person who's a child of God? I mean, think of what a, a powerful position that's in. Every, every schoolyard kid talking with their friends has gotten into the argument of whose dad could beat up whose dad. You know, my dad is six foot two and he can, you know, lift a tractor tire and he could, he could beat your dad. Well, if you're dad is God, imagine the power that you have. I think there's a lot of benefits we could talk about. If your dad is God, you have that power, obviously. You also have assurance. If you're a child of God, you know that, that, that God is going to listen to your prayers. You're assured that he loves you because he calls you his daughter or his son. I think also that there's a great intimacy, which we talked about last week, being able to see his face, being close to him. I think also one of the things I want to talk about, a benefit of being a child of God, is that children resemble their parents. And so if you're a child of God, that means you resemble God. You look like him in some way. In 1 John chapter 3, it says this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. It says that we shall be like Christ. We resemble our parent. And so if we are children of God, that means we resemble God. We look like him. Now, we don't know exactly what God looks like. The passage that we just read makes that clear. What we will be, we do not yet know. We don't know what we're going to look like. We haven't yet seen God's face, but we know that we will resemble him. We know that we will resemble Christ and what he is. Now, there is a dog scratching at my door. This is one of the benefits of Zoom. Wait one minute, I'll be right back. You want to say hi, Judah? Here's Judah. All right. So, what we will be, we don't know yet, but we will resemble God and we will resemble Christ, his son. Now, think about that. We're, we're not going to resemble Jesus Christ crucified, we're going to resemble Jesus Christ resurrected. We're not going to resemble uh, Jesus Christ in weakness, in poverty, where he had no home and no place to lay his head. Rather, we're going to resemble Jesus Christ glorified, seated at the right hand of God. This is a wonderful promise to be called a child of God. Now, I want to just talk about one more blessing of resembling God before we get into a little practical application. 
So if you resemble God, then that, that shapes the way that you think about yourself. It, it produces a self-confidence that even if somebody else were to talk badly about you, you, you know that you look like God himself. You, you resemble him in, in character and in nature. And if God is beautiful, then that makes you beautiful. If you resemble your father and your father is beautiful, then you are beautiful. I mean, just like, what if you could be more handsome than Brad Pitt? I mean, Dan's already well on his way. Um, but like, if you could just bump up just a percentage point to look like Brad Pitt, like we would probably all want to be a little more beautiful. I remember when MTV put out a show in the early 2000s, maybe called I Want a Famous Face. And they would find people who were willing to get plastic surgery to look like their favorite celebrity. And very famously, there was two twins, Mike and Matt Schlepp, who spent $20,000 to try to look like Brad Pitt. You know, now we have Snapchat dysmorphia. And Snapchat dysmorphia is a, is a kind of body dysmorphia, similar to something like anorexia, where you're not seeing yourself as you really are, like anorexics, right? They, they don't see themselves as being gaunt and, and bony and, and overly unhealthfully thin. Uh, they still see themselves as being fat. So there's a dysmorphia. They, they, they don't see their body accurately. Well, Snapchat dysmorphia is when people have been looking at themselves on Snapchat with the filters, with the you know giant sparkly anime style eyes, and and you know rosy cheeks and all that, and they 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 go to their plastic surgeon and say, I want you to make me look like this. And plastic surgeons have been saying this is a real problem that's happening, and you know obviously we can't make people look like this. It's not realistic, and they've been having to uh, send a lot of people in for therapy because they, they, they're so stuck on this. And this article that I'm showing you right now is showing that Zoom meetings are causing an upsurge in cosmetic surgeries. And so now maybe we won't even refer to it as Snapchat dysmorphia, but a Zoom dysmorphia. You know, people keep looking at themselves and seeing themselves on screen and not liking what they're seeing. It, it's creating a, a lot of anxiety and, and, and depression. And what the world needs right now is to understand what could really make them be children of God. You know, rather than spending $20,000 on plastic surgery to look like Brad Pitt, if people would try to make peace in the world, if people would go out and, and actually try and bring harmony and try and bring reconciliation, they would understand that they resemble God. They would understand how beautiful they really are. Proverbs chapter 31 verse 30 says that charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. I, that applies to men as well. If, if you fear the Lord, that's praiseworthy. That's beautiful. You know, the most beautiful people are still going to get old and lose their hair and lose their teeth and all that. Brad Pitt someday is not going to be handsome. Like if you love Brad Pitt and you're a total fanboy, fangirl, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. Brad Pitt's going to be ugly someday. And so are you. <laughs> and I'm already there. So we can't lean on physical beauty and perfection to give ourselves confidence, but we can be peacemakers. And, and that's a way to truly be beautiful. Can I get a little, little of this amen action there for the word of God? <clears throat> um, okay. So let me do a real quick, a real quick, there's a phone in my room doing a Darth Vader breathing sound. I got really distracted there. Okay, so let's talk about some practicals here. Uh, one of the things uh, I do want to talk about how we make peace is to make peace in the world. If we were in person, I might draw this out longer. We could talk about making peace in the home first. Uh, we could talk about making peace in your neighborhood and community second. And then I wanted to give you a global perspective of how to make peace in the world. Uh, but I'm just going to focus on this one today to keep the sermon short. And what I'm talking about here is evangelism specifically. 
that we need to make peace between mankind and almighty God. That's a, a peacemaking that needs to happen in the world. And that's how we have a global vision for peacemaking. I, I know that at this time right now, evangelism is extremely challenging. It's extremely hard to meet new people to share our faith with. And it's even hard to follow up with the people we already know because we have to socially distance. Uh, but I don't want that to uh, be, be an excuse for why we don't talk about evangelism. It needs to constantly be on our minds and constantly be on our hearts. We have to constantly think of ways that we can advance the gospel because it's so vital. Because the world really is at odds with God. It really is the nation with 10,000 going against the nation with 20,000. And if the world will not submit and cast down their crowns before the, the Lord Almighty, then he will come in judgment uh, on the world. And there is a day of wrath that's being postponed until God will no longer tolerate sin. And that day will be a hundred times worse than 9-11. That day of God's wrath will be a million times worse than COVID-19. Uh, and we have to warn the world uh, that they need to make their peace with God. In Acts 17, starting in verse 27, you know, we, we oftentimes look at this passage uh, as the great uh, sermon that Paul preaches at the Are Areopagus in Athens, and how he's such a great peacemaker by talking about how God wants to reach out to you, and he wants to have a relationship with you, and if you'll just seek him, you can find him. And that's all a part of his sermon, but you know, we oftentimes don't read to the end of his sermon when he also includes the wrath of God. And I want you just to read with me a little bit here, starting in verse 27, where, where he's starting out very much with the good news. He says, God did all this, meaning he's raised up nations and he's torn others down and he's orchestrated history at, up to this moment so that people would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us any one of us. In him, we live and move and have our being, which is what one of the Greek poets had written. And he quotes another Greek poet, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. You see, isn't that neat? Paul is, is like referencing this idea of wanting to be a child of God, that, that we are all created in his image. But he goes on, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. He's talking about that day of judgment. Now, this is sobering news. Jesus' resurrection is not merely a sign of salvation. It's also a sign of judgment. For those who have put their faith in Jesus, it's, it's a sign of, of grace that he rose from the dead and we will resemble him and rise from the dead someday too. But for those that reject Jesus, it's a sign that this man, Jesus, is no mere man alone, but he's also the son of God. He is the divine being, and death cannot hold him back. And when he comes someday in justice, and he comes someday to judge the world, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And God is commanding the world right now to repent. He's commanding the world, make your peace now, before that day of judgment. Now, church, I know this is not an easy message for us to communicate, but this is part of the gospel message. And if we're going to be peacemakers, we, we have to have this on our hearts and minds. It's obviously not the first thing you bring up with somebody when you're sharing your faith, unless you're like a Westboro Baptist church, you know, rational people understand you don't start with that. Paul didn't start with that. But we have to think about it. We have to talk about it. At some point, it has to be brought up. 
certainly we, we have to have a conviction in our hearts that our neighbors are in danger of the wrath of God, and we have to love them and try and help them make peace with God. How we do it, I don't know. In COVID, it's really challenging, but we, we've got to be thinking about it. We've got to be praying about it. So just listen to the message of the cross. We're going to take communion here, and I want you to just hear this message of the cross one more time, that for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, it is a symbol of forgiveness. We, we look at that cross, and we know that the wrath of God that should be upon us was instead placed on Jesus Christ. The punishment that has brought us peace was placed upon Jesus Christ. But for the world, that cross is not a symbol of, uh, of, of mercy and grace. That's, that, that cross is a foreshadowing of the wrath that is coming. So there should be a mixture of, of gratitude when we look at the cross and a mixture of, of sober, sober uh, reverence and awe. Uh, for, for the judgment that will be coming someday for our, our neighbors and loved ones. Let's remember, please, to be peacemakers. Let's remember, please, to be loving and caring about our neighbors and our loved ones. Uh, let's, let's help whoever we can, however we can, uh, to make peace with God. Amen. Let's say a prayer, and uh, we'll have just a moment to meditate, and then I think the sisters are going to lead us in another song of worship. Uh, Father in heaven, you know, these are words of life. These are words of warning. Uh, you've given us these words so that we can reach out for you and find you. I just pray, Father, that this is not merely going to end here with the church preaching to the choir, but God, that we could in some way reach our neighbors. Uh, we are communing right now uh, the, the blood and the body of Christ, and we are taking real food and real drink that is our salvation, Father. Uh, but we also want to share it with with the countless numbers of people uh, who, who are not blessed as we are to know you. Uh, help this, this food that we take in to transform us to be more like Jesus and be uh, resembling you more and more and help us to bring this message of peace to the world. We love you, God. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of sin? Jesus is calling you. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling you. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. 
Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life was born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for me. Tell the world the treasure you found in the Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Selena and Sarah. All right. At this time, we are going to have our brother Lee lead our thoughts in, uh, I think, prayer for our contribution. Yep. Uh, and I, I just want to say, uh, you know, it's great that we have the, the Tidely app right now that we can continue giving, you know, online, not having to rely on, you know, face-to-face -face or everybody having to mail checks different places and all that kind of stuff. Um, so if you, if you use the app, that's great. Um, if you don't and you're planning to give some other way, just make sure um, that's something that you have on your heart. Um, because really the, the giving is all about, you know, what we want to give back to God uh, that comes from our heart. So we'll go ahead and pray for that. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for, uh, for you and for the blessings that you give to us. Uh, even if this time of having to, to stay home and uh, stay away from people, it's, it's a blessing that you've given us the technology to connect face-to-face -face, uh, electronically. And we just pray that we'll give back, you know, a little bit of, of what you've given to us, that we can uh, be generous with the, the money that you've given us and uh, that that money can go uh, to spread the gospel uh, and for good works. Uh, we especially pray right now, you know, being home, that we can uh, just give generously from our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lee. Uh, it's good to see the Singleton family, too. Uh, so 
we are going to close out here with one more song. And this time we're actually going to have, I think Lamore is going to lead us and maybe we'll have Dylan as backup vocals too. Uh, but before we get to that, we I just want to remind everybody that December 2nd, we are going to be meeting on Zoom for a midweek all together. And we're going to be talking about our finances as a church. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I've been talking with Lee and Corbin about how to make that excellent. And so please mark that in your calendars and make that happen. All right. Um, let's kick it over to the brothers for one more song. Cool. Can you guys hear me all right? Cool. Awesome. All right. Let's this saying, I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb. Filled with the Holy Ghost, I am. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. Well, I went down. Well, I went down to the river to pray. To the river to pray. Well, I went down to the river to pray. Well, I went down to the river to pray. Felt so good that I left the whole day. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. That's not all, and that's not all. There's more beside, there's more beside, and that's not all. There's more besides, and that's not all. There's more besides. I've been to the river and I've been baptized. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. Amen. Ukulele for the win. Thanks, guys. Hey, um, feel free to log off. Our church service is over, but we're going to leave it open a little bit longer. I know some people like to fellowship a little bit. Love you all.